You are listening to Prophet Pearls with Nehemia Gordon and Keith Johnson, exploring biblical prophecy for yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Welcome to Prophet Pearls in Jerusalem. This is Keith Johnson along with the number one uh, reporter, the, the hottest reporter in Jerusalem, Nehemia Gordon. We just got back to Jerusalem, folks, from a, a major event where Nehemia had his... Uh, his, his, his really cool, uh, I don't even know what you call it here. It's recording a, device? A recording the one, device. The one we're recording this episode we're, on? Yeah, absolutely. We got on a bus and a train and ended up in a very special spot. We're going to talk a little bit about that. But we're here in the land of Jerusalem uh, doing whatever it takes to bring you the power and the pearls from the prophets. And I have to tell you, um, it's special to be here. One, you're hearing this uh, later in time, but in the time that we're actually making the recordings, we we, we went to three places today. And I, mean, I don't know if I'm not going to be able to talk about it. I think I have Go to talk about Go ahead and tell it. the people. But we're here uh, in Jerusalem. It's we, Purim you today. Know, it's Purim today, and we took a break uh, to... to uh, to go out and, and be with the people, went to three uh, significant places. The first place we went to is actually the spot of a terrorist attack that took place this morning. Uh, at Just at the after we had uh, recorded our second um, Prophet Pearls, we decided to get on a bus and uh, the uh, public transportation to get over to that spot. And we did actually did a podcast from there. Now, by the time folks are listening to yeah. this, how would they be able to hear the podcast and what is it called, Nehemiah? Yeah, so they can go to uh, my website, com, mm-hmm. and there's actually podcasts that come out um, on, you know, I, I actually can't tell you if it's every week or it, it's as I moved, I, mm-hmm. I put out episodes of the podcast. Mm-hmm. Um, but this episode is called uh, The Scene of the Crime. Yeah, and so look, I really want to invite people to do that. Um, the date is... March 6th today. Yeah, so that will be the date of the podcast, and that's the title. Yeah. You'll up here hear exactly what happened, but um, it really it is it really is a special thing to be here. We're going to be going over uh, 1 Samuel chapter 11, and I will say that this yeah. particular is kind of interesting. You know, we usually have um, people who are our Prophet Pearl partners. Uh, we actually didn't have anyone that sponsored this, and so we're sponsoring well, really? it ourselves. Oh, we are. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, so uh, I want to thank our Prophet Pearl's partners, uh, uh, McCor <laughs> Hebrew Foundation and Biblical Foundations Academy International. Oh, yeah. And you know what's really interesting? Um, so people can kind of make assumptions like, yeah, yeah, you guys, you know, things are, you know, you're well known and people know you. And in fact, today, let me just say something, folks. We're on a bus after we've gone and done three different podcasts. By the way, Nehemia, can I charge you for those? Like three pot? I guess been, I, I, you have I to charge, charge me you. for what <laughs> I've done. <laughs> but listen, we're on a bus, you guys, and we're um, we're coming back from these interviews that we did. One at Damascus Gate, one at the spot of the terrorist uh, attack, and also one across from the place where Yehovah said his name forever. Three really, really wonderful things. And we're on a bus on our way back to do this recording, and a guy walks up to us on the bus. Neither of us, I, I don't know the guy, and he says, uh, aren't you two supposed to be on a Harley Davidson? And I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> This guy sees us what? on the bus and asks us this question because he had seen what you had sent out. And Nehemia, again, this is really amazing. You send out these uh, newsletters and, and, and you'd send out an update about, yeah. you know, this video from the from the motorcycle. And it literally goes to thousands of people <laughs> around the world, including and to a man in Jerusalem, in Jerusalem yeah. who's on a bus and sees us. Yeah. And you had just sent it out that morning. Right. Yeah. It's incredible. It really is. Um, yeah, it really is. Uh, you know, and... and <laughs> You know, and, and in, in the video, and if people haven't seen it, they can head over to my YouTube channel or to um, my Facebook page. And uh, what, what we were saying in, in the video, basically the, the message of the video is we're willing to do whatever it takes mm-hmm. to record these episodes. We originally were going to do it long distance, and then we realized we're going to have to go on planes, trains, automobiles, and even Harley Davidson's. Absolutely. And he made me ride on a Harley yeah. to illustrate this point. Mm-hmm. And uh, boy, that was scary. And, um, you know, and, and so the guy sees us and says, shouldn't you be on a Harley? <laughs> no, <laughs> we're on the yeah. Jerusalem Municipal Bus. You know, it's really interesting. Uh, we're on the bus. And, and, and uh, again, I know we talked a little bit about it the last time. But um, so this week, for example, there isn't there's no Parker Pro partner. But yet, guess what? We still have to have it edited. We still have to take right. care of the things. And, and so, in effect, we are sponsoring. What does that really mean? Um, you know, we'll have to find yeah. it. And so maybe there are people that are listening now. Whether it's uh, you visiting NehemiahsWall.com or go to BFAInternational.com, really easy in both places for you to make a donation of any amount that can um, that can support us. And really beyond whether you're on the support team or whether you're part of the premium content library, you can also go to either of those sites. And, and one time, one time uh, blessing, a one time uh, donation, um, re- it really does help us. So I really want to encourage people to do that. We're going to be dealing with First Samuel on Nehemiah chapter 11. And again, 
uh, this is actually a, 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 there's I, I actually have a geographical question. You know, and what I love about being able to do these uh, these profit pearl, pearls with you is, we you know, I've been here a number of times. We were on our third tour with BFA International, but I'm still a rookie. And and in terms of knowing exactly where things are and how it fits, and uh, but every time I run across one of these places and then I open my Bible and read it, it it really is really interesting. And so right away we've got an important place that we, we that we read about that has a real significance to it in terms of scripture. So in First Samuel chapter eleven verse fifteen, if I can go ahead and read that. Please. So. Um, I'm sorry, 1 Samuel 11, verse 14, the prophet Samuel is saying to the people, come, let us go to Gilgal and renew the kingdom there. That's what it says in uh, in, in the NASB, to renew the kingdom there. And and when he, when he says that, you have to ask yourself the question, renew, so what what, what, what was the past? I mean, isn't that the point? You, you look at it and you ask yourself, he, he's saying the significant place is Gilgal, and, in, and then again, in the English, he uses the word uh, to renew there the kingdom. I, I think that's kind of interesting. It's um, speaking of the kingdom. It makes me think to myself, is he talking about the covenant? Is he talking about something different? And in context, we kind of find out um, the significance of that place. But I wanted to ask you, mm-hmm. when you see Gilgal today, present day, mm-hmm. um, is that a place that's easy to go to that you can say it's here? Or is there some debate about where that place is? Yeah, it's not entirely clear. And part of the problem is there may be more than one Gilgal. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> that's where it gets confusing. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, I don't know where it is. You know, it's funny because there's uh, the crossing of the Jordan and they talk about Gilgal. Right, and exactly. Then, that and would then, be the first one I would think of, would but think it of, sounds like that's probably not what it's because that, about. Yeah, it thinks it's that's in the Jordan else. Valley. Exactly. So, anyway, but they're going to go to this place. And what are they going to do? He says to renew the kingdom there. Mm-hmm. Ah. So, what is renewing the kingdom well, I guess we have to go in context because it, it can we read verses twelve and thirteen? Yeah, because those give the context of the passage. Yep. Yeah, Okay, I actually don't have that pulled up, so you're oh, gonna have to okay. read it. And the people said to Shmuel, "You know who, why I don't have twelve and thirteen? Because it's not part of because the portion. Because the folks who selected this portion decided they didn't want to give us those two they verses to disembody it from the context. Yeah, right, let's break tradition. Okay, let's. Yeah, let's, <laughs> yeah, we're not bound by tradition, especially me. <laughs> yeah. So we're looking at one Samuel chapter. 14, no, chapter 11, <laughs> sorry, uh, chapter 11, yes. verses, verses 12 to 13. Yes. I'm going to read you this in the JPS. Awesome. Um, and it says, the people then said to Samuel, who was it said, shall Shaul be king over us? Hand them over and we will put them to death. But Saul replied, no man shall be put to death this day. For this day, Jehovah has brought victory to Israel. Mm-hmm. So... So it's an interesting picture, um, and we have a similar picture with David. Yep, um, he's anointed Samuel, or sorry, Saul is anointed king over Israel by Samuel, which means he comes and he pours oil on his head, mm-hmm. and he kind of is king, but he's not really truly recognized by the people as king. Yeah, and then this uh, event happens, and then they say, okay. Who are those people who didn't think, you know, say that you were king? And probably, it's, and when he says the event happens, they had victory. Right, they had a battle and a victory. And um, you know, I, I I suspect that some of the people who were saying, "Yeah, I'll turn over those people who didn't recognize him as king," I bet those were some of the people who said <laughs> he's not really our king, <laughs> yeah. and they were kind of deflecting. Yeah. But but Saul uh, decides, look, today is not going to be a day for for you know mm-hmm. those who didn't believe me, who didn't have faith. Today is a day to glorify Jehovah. And how we're going to glorify Jehovah? We're going to not only proclaim me king we're going to renew the kingdom and yeah. that's a pretty cool scene yeah um and i gotta wonder can, can, can i can i oh i'm gonna hold this thought no no i, I what i what, what hit me was just the, yeah. the the word of renewing the kingdom mm-hmm. i mean i just you know i have to be honest with you i, I immediately th- think about the times that the covenant is renewed or yeah. when there's time for people to come back and say let's again decide we are going to follow Yehovah with our hearts mind we're going to do the things that he's called us to do and so mm. that's kind of what I, you know, as I was reading that, I was thinking about that. We yeah. have many examples that we could go to. Um, but then it says all the people went to Gilgal and there they made Saul king mm-hmm. before Yehovah and Gilgal. Mm-hmm. There they also offered sacrifices of peace offerings before Yehovah. And there Saul and all the men of Israel rejoiced <clears throat> greatly. So you're right. It's like, yeah. here's the first act. And then after the first act, they had to kind of like a test, a little war, a little bat, not a little, yeah. but it, and there's victory. Now we're like, okay, let's do this for real. And they bring the people, they bring all the and, people together. And, and I just want to share my thought here. And this is me completely stepping out on the limb. You, 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 you've criticized me about this before, and I, I completely accept that criticism. Well, I'm not used to it. It's it. not something that you normally would have all done right. for a year. And, I mean, well, I, I, 
look, this is me thinking out loud as I read the scripture. And, and there's there's a few passages that I read about. And here I'm, I, I wonder if this isn't a picture of the Messiah. And um, what I mean by that is, is there's certain passages that I've read in scripture that the way I read them and other people read them very differently. But the way I read them is they describe the situation where the Messiah will come and he won't initially be accepted. He'll kind of be rejected, in, in fact. And <laughs> Keith has this look at his face. I wish I could get that picture up. <laughs> Haven't you read Isaiah 53? Um, where it sounds like the Messiah will be rejected. And I wonder if, if, there won't, if this isn't a picture of, of, of this end time situation with the Messiah, where the Messiah will come and initially he'll be, have been rejected by the people of Israel. And after this great victory takes place, then he'll come back and they'll say, okay, now it's time to renew the kingdom. And then uh, I love verse 12 of Isaiah 53, where it ends with, with them dividing up the spoils among the many. I mean, by that point, everyone's going to say, okay, this is really the guy. <laughs> now we've got to go defeat our enemies and, and, uh, you know, and, and bring victory. So that, that's just, like I said, I'm stepping out on a limb. I'm, I'm completely off the reservation. I'm speculating about what may be, but I wonder if this isn't a picture. And of, so when you say the picture, and so again, why, why, does that, why is that the case? Because we have like a two-step process. We have we have Saul Absolutely. first, where there there clearly were people who said, yeah. ah, he ain't it. Then there's this victory, and now they're saying, oh, he is it. And I love Saul. Instead of he could have legitimately said, those people have rebelled against me by not believing in me, by rejecting me. And instead, he said, no, today it's not about me; it's about glorifying Jehovah. Can I get an amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Wow, that sounds. I'm really excited. Cool. All right. Can we so go then on? Samuel yeah. said to all of Israel, "Behold, I have listened to your voice and all that you said to me, and I have appointed a king over you." And if, you know, those who don't know the background, here's the homework: go to the first part of Samuel where where this whole issue comes up of them saying, "Give us a king," and that process. And in that process, we get Saul, and and and, and it really is. We didn't we didn't actually yeah. have a section where we talked about it, but it really is. Yeah. It really is an, an important Samuel's. And, and what he does in this passage actually reminds. So that's him, homework. Go read. Yeah, the, go read the it, context. It, please. It really is. It really is. And uh, now here is the king walking before you, but I am old and gray. And it's and now it's like, and I actually, I have to tell you a story. Well, I won't wait till I, wait till we do that. So he says, here's the king walking before you, but I am old and gray and behold, my sons are with you. Though I'm not sure that was a really good thing. <laughs> and I have walked before you from my youth, even to this day. Great story reading about Samuel. First Samuel, man, my one of, one of my favorite passages, first Samuel chapter three. Um, where we just deal with the issue of Samuel and the, and the process he went through of, of tuning his ear to hearing the voice of Yehovah. And he says, I've walked before you from my youth even to this day. Then he says in verse 3, here I am. So the sh- there's a shift, Nehemiah. And the shift right, we is... We were talking about Saul who's king and yeah, now all of a sudden we're, now talking, we're talking about, about Samuel. Samuel. And, 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 and the shift is, like I said, that we've dealt with Saul. And he says, okay, hey, we're going to go. We're going to do this. You guys rejoice. Here's your king. Mm-hmm. Now I've got, a re- I've got an announcement. I'm retiring. <laughs> you know, in other words, it's been a good run. And I almost wonder if Saul, Samuel doesn't kind of look at Saul and say, okay, I gave you your guy. I mean, I'm not saying that he could see the future, but it's like, okay, I gave you your guy. And uh, now I'm washing my hands. You know, he's, he's your guy. This is my opinion, because when I look at the story of Saul and what Saul and Samuel's interactions are, clearly Samuel and Saul have a, uh, a falling out. Mm-hmm. But... Samuel says to Israel, so he thought he was dumb, but he's not. I think Samuel <laughs> knew that he wasn't the real oh, really? deal. That's just my opinion. Oh, really? Then Samuel says to all of Israel, Behold, I have listened to your voice and all that you said to me. Um, now, here's the king walking before you. Okay, I'm old and I've done what I've done. Bear witness against me before Yehovah. And, and I love what it says, the next two words. Could this be the word of the week? No. You won't do it? No. 12-3? You can make the word of the week. No, no, no. You don't like my... Sh- oh, I guess we did. We, We've done that. We did, Come on. We, let's we see did. something more unique. And his passing. anointed, his Mashiach, um, whose, ox I have I, whose ox have I taken? Whose donkey have I taken? Whom have I defrauded? Whom have I oppressed? Or from whose hand have I taken a bribe to blind my eyes with? I will restore it to you. Let me... Let me... Let, you know... Do you have any response to that? Are we okay? Well, absolutely. I mean, so first of all, Moses says a very similar thing during the rebellion of Korach. Mm-hmm. Um, it's uh, actually I have the verse here, but it doesn't. I, I've quoted the verse here, but I, I don't have the the, the, the reference. And we so. talked about the original Torah pearls. We talked about the original Torah pearls. It says, and Moses was very angry, uh, and he said to Yehovah, uh, "Do not turn to their offering." Uh, and here it's interesting. He's speaking to Yehovah, and there they're they're speaking. He, uh, Samuel's speaking to the people. He says, um, "Not one donkey." 
have I uh, taken from them, and I have not done any evil to uh, even one of them. Mm-hmm. So he's saying, look, I haven't done anything to anybody. Why, why, are, they, why are they rejecting me? Mm-hmm. And it's interesting, the parallel. So both in, in Korach, who, remember, that's in, in the original Torah portal. That's the name of the portion, actually. Mm-hmm. Both Korach and, and the people of Samuel's time, they were rejecting God's chosen prophet as, his rep, as the representative of Yehovah. Mm-hmm. Uh, Korach wanted to be the representative himself. Right? Mm. Remember that? Yes. Um, in other words, his point was like, whoa, Moses, why is he so special? I, I, we should all be, you know, we should, yeah, we should all be. he wasn't going for it. Right. Yeah. Um, and the people of Samuel's time, what they wanted was a king instead of the prophet. And so in both cases, there's this feeling like you're rejecting the prophet. Mm-hmm. Um, now, there's a big difference, though. Korach was an anarchist. Mm-hmm. And maybe you could call him an egalitarian. Mm-hmm. But really, I think he was an anarchist. Mm-hmm. Um Meaning he, his his position was everybody should be equal. Everybody should be the same. There shouldn't be one person mm-hmm. who God deals with more than others. Well, God doesn't decide that mm-hmm. or didn't decide that. He had a different, you know, God had a different plan, Korach. Mm-hmm. Um, the people of Samuel's times, they were monarchists. It's, mm-hmm. it's, it's very different. But in both cases, the, the prophet represented what today might be called, a, in my view, a libertarian government. Um, and, uh, you know, the idea is obey God, treat your neighbor decently, and the government's only role is mm-hmm. to enforce God's law and defend you from foreign invasion. Can I get an amen? amen. Hallelujah. Mm-hmm. So, but basically, he stands before them and he and he goes down this list yeah. and and uh, and they said because he asked the question. He says, "Now I'm, I'm I'm here. I am. Bear witness against me." And they said, mm-hmm. "You have not defrauded us. You have not oppressed us. Mm-hmm. You have not taken anything from any man's hand." He said, to "Them, Yehovah is witness against you." In other words, came out of your mouth. And his anointed is witness this day. His Mashiach, when that's who Saul was. He was the anointed. Uh, so you're going to force me to make this the word of the week, I'm aren't you? Have to make I guess it has to be week. the word of the week. All I right. don't know how you couldn't. All right, can we finish the verse now? <laughs> yeah. And his anointed is witness this day that you have found nothing in my hand. And they said, <laughs> witness. <laughs> witness. Maybe that's the love, word witness. I think we'll witness have two is going to have to know. Witness has got to be it. We've okay. done Mashiach before. We have to, no, it yeah, really, okay. it really. So the word here is Ed. I and this Dalit. is not an easy th- situation. Come on now. Well, I think it's actually quite easy, but... No. <laughs> what's the problem? <laughs> well, okay, go ahead and do your normal spiel, Mr. Smarty. Okay. Every word has three, 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 three roots. Go ahead, go, do your spiel. And Every so I can... word has a three-letter root. Yes. And what is the three-letter root of I and Dalit? And that's what I'd like to know. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, and and okay, there's some question about what that is. Yeah, that's why I you say... Yeah, Dalit, you'll say it is. Say, you say that the Vav is there. Well, where's the Vav? Come on, Nehemiah, come, come and explain it to us. I'm a rookie. I'm looking at it. Mm-hmm. I don't see it. So we have this concept called hollow verbs. That's right. Hollow verbs are verbs that not all three letters appear in every form of the word. Mm-hmm. Um, a very easy example is, um, I don't know, the word bana is he built, or, or let's take the example of to give. Mm-hmm. So we have Netanyahu. Netanyahu. The root is Natan, he gave, Yahu is Yehovah. So Nun Tav Nun is the root. Uh, very easy, Netanyahu. Um, and I can say, Natan, he gave me. Mm-hmm. Okay, Natanli, he gave me something. But then if I say 10, give, mm-hmm. as a command, so what happened to the first Nun? Mm-hmm. And the answer is it drops. It drops. And then... I could say, Natati, I gave. The second nun drops. Mm-hmm. So in these hollow verbs... The some, nun is Trixie, Nehemiah. <laughs> it's Trixie. Mm-hmm. It's so funny. It hides in the other, uh, the other letters well, and nun, shows up as a little dot. Nun is Wiley. I'll give you that. that. Okay. <laughs> but isn't that interesting? There's nun tav nun. Yeah. And in some situations, the first nun disappears. In some in other the situations, yeah. the second nun disappears. Mm-hmm. And in some situations, both nun, di- <laughs> nun disappear. Um, for example, latet is the latet. infinitive to give. So the, there's only one letter from the root, the letter Tav, <laughs> in the middle. Um, so, all right, those are hollow verbs. And they get complicated. And hollow verbs are not rare. In fact, I haven't done this, but I imagine if you took a stati- statistics of how many they show up verbs appear in the Tanakh, if we made a list of all the verbs, I bet you it would be 25 to 50% are hollow verbs. That would be my guess. But they're, they're all over the place. You'd be hard-pressed to find a page of the Bible in Hebrew that doesn't have a whole, whole bunch of hollow verbs. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe if it was a list of names, you wouldn't find many hollow verbs. But, mm-hmm. um, so ed is a hollow verb. And the question then becomes, I and Dalit, obviously, and it means witness. Mm-hmm. I and Dalit are obviously part of the root. Mm-hmm. Uh, what's the missing letter? And we could have a discussion. Is it Vav? Is it possibly Yud? For example, you say to testify is Leha'id. Leha'id. So, but maybe that's the Yud of he feels. So possibly mm-hmm. it's a Vav. And that's a whole question about Vav and Yud being well, switching but you know, places. Like you said, it's so yeah. easy. Hebrew is such an easy language. It is a very what easy the question. These, very these easy hollow language. verbs. And By the way, nuts. an example of hollow verb is the root of the name Yehovah, mm-hmm. where the root is He Yud He. 
well, where's the yud in Yehovah? It's not mm-hmm. there. It's a hollow verb. Mm-hmm. Um, if you so, don't yeah. know any Hebrew, you'd say, well, no, it's the first letter of their name. And then they wouldn't understand that that's, you know. What it, would they it, say? No, I'm saying if you don't know anything in you so where's the yud? It's, what's the first letter? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So anyway. Um, yes. Yeah, so, but uh, anyway, so it's either I and Vav Dalad or I and Yud Dalad. I guess we could. Yeah. And it's difficult to determine which one it is. Um, but yeah, meaning that those Vav and Yud sometimes are a little bit complicated. Mm-hmm. Um, you actually would battle against those who would say it's a Vav. You would, you'd argue against that. Why can't we accept it? It's a Vav. What's the proof that it's a Vav? Uh, that's it's just what they say it. That's what they say. Oh, they say it. <laughs> <laughs> well, either way, that's the word for witness. And, and, and what makes things even more complicated is we have a guttural letter here. Mm-hmm. So you've got an ayin as the first letter. And so what you normally you do is you look at the pattern of the vowels for ayin. You'd dial it, or, or let's say mm-hmm. a three-letter word where yud is the middle or, or vav is the middle letter. Mm-hmm. And you'd say, which one does the, does this verb uh, follow? And then you'd be able to determine if it's a vav or a yud. Mm-hmm. But here we have a situation where um, you, you, you have a, an ayin, which which messes things up. And the other thing is you never have it in the Kal conjugation. We have seven conjugations. Mm-hmm. I don't think uh, I, this, this root is ever in Kal, or if it is, it's rare. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas, let's say a word like Lashuv, mm-hmm. to return, I know that's a Vav, um, even though that Vav drops in certain situations, mm-hmm. versus other words that have a Yud. What's an example of a word that might have a Yud? Mm. Um, a, oh, Haya is an example. Mm-hmm. Okay, but there it's complicated because of other gutturals. Anyway, Ayin Dalad Ed, Witness. Lehaid to testify to give to bear testimony. That is our word of the week. Okay, that's, awesome. That's the short answer. And the answer, witness, witness. Wow, Ed. I'm not going to throw another. Would, I'm not going to throw a bone that would just wait. Would you Would you testify here, Keith? Yes, I would. Uh, yeah, I really would. And actually, what I what I would like to tell is I'd like to tell you a story. Um, okay. This This was such an amazing uh, fra- um, story to me because mm-hmm. the first time I ever read it, it really struck me deeply that it, it goes further than Jim just putting out a list. This is Samuel standing before a group of people saying, I've been in a position of power and authority. I've been in a pos- position where I'm the one that could that could do these very things that I'm asking you if I did. Have I oppressed you as a leader? Have I taken from you? Have I used my, my authority to, to, to pad my pockets? In fact, we were driving in Jerusalem, Nehemiah, and this is really funny. This happened today. We're driving in Jerusalem, and not far from Bubby Dina's house, there's this building. And every time I've come to Jerusalem, I look at this building, and it's completely out of the flow of, of, of the architecture of the of the place. It looks like we call it the Transformer Building. And this building was built and, and, and this building was based on the fact that a leader that a leader, that, the, that a leader actually did some of the things that Sa- that Samuel says he didn't do. Right, he took, took, a bribe. A, took a bribe, took a bribe. Prime advantage. Minister of Israel took a bribe. It was a this is not the present Prime Minister of Israel. This no. is a past Prime Minister of Israel. Yeah. And I was telling Nehemiah I had been in the airport and I saw this man. And Netanyahu never got caught. Yeah, yeah and uh, take the <laughs> I don't know that he's ever done anything wrong. We, how could you say something? He's like a that? politician. This is what they do. No, and so anyway, but my point is that uh, uh, this this uh, what was his name again? David Almer. Yeah, and he, he w- was put on trial. And, and they asked was, him a question, was, and they said, "Look, did you take money in a brown paper bag?" Oh, no, it wasn't. Did you take money? There was witnesses saying that. And, and, and he and, admitted that the money came in a brown paper bag. Well, and his said, argument is, says it wasn't a bribe. It was for my it was for my campaign. I just didn't want to pay campaign taxes on it. You took money in a brown paper bag. What are you talking about? <laughs> This is our conversation today. And so here we've got Samuel, a man of integrity, a man of God. He's been selected. He says, I've walked before you since my youth. That's a long time. He's an old and gray now. And he stood before the people and he said, look, I've, I, this is, have I done this? And, and no one said anything. And when I read this, Nehemiah, it really, really struck me hard. It really struck me really deeply. I was, I was the head of a ministry. I founded a ministry called Christian Athletes United for Spiritual Empowerment. And we were a ministry that the, the, the people involved in the ministry – the high percentage of them were multimillionaires, mm-hmm. multimillionaires. And, and, and this ministry drew a lot of attention. And I was the leader of this ministry. And, and as I had gone through a bit of a transition, it was a result of visiting Israel and having an encounter with Yehovah in a, in a way that just radically changed my life. I knew that there was coming a time for the end of my ministry. And I decided to do something really radical. Hmm. I actually read this verse in front of these multimillionaires hmm. as I knew it was the end of my time as being being the leader of the ministry and there was going to be a transition. So I stood before them and I said, I want to read a story and I want to read this story and I want to then put it in present context. And I stood before them and I said, listen, here I am, bear witness against me before Yehovah. And I said, 
here's the list. Have I taken anybody's money? Have I cheated? Have I have I done? And I kind of went through some other. I used some other uh, phrases. And you know, now, there was, was the, the most, issue with with that basketball player's donkey, right? No, 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 no. <laughs> and I and I and I went through the entire list with them, and I added some other things for yeah. them, and I said, now, can anyone? And I publicly to do this, and I, I want to say this. Hmm. So he's in front of who knows how many people. Yeah. At that point, I was in front of a hundred people, the, yeah. husbands, wives, children, etc. And I said, now listen, I'm about to move on into something else. I'm about to do the BFA. Um, this is coming to an end. Is there anyone that would say that I've done anything that's not been integral regarding resources, regarding, you know, relationships, anything like that? And it was really a blessing. Um, they said, we are witness. You have not done that. And, and it allowed me, it really allowed me to transition into this next ministry. You know, the BFA ministry is we started from scratch, literally from scratch. But it was it was it was birthed. As I was at the other end of this ministry with these multimillionaires. And, you know, I got to just tell you, it, it was a blessing because when there's money involved and I'm telling you at any given day, you know, this because you uh, I introduced you to my friend uh, Reggie White, who is a multimillionaire himself. And when there's money, and he was part of the ministry. Yeah. Right? And he was part of the, he was one of the founders of our ministry. And when money's involved, it, it draws a lot of attention. It uh, <laughs> good and bad. But one of the blessings for me was to be able to walk away from that and have them say that that has not been the case. And, and, and my, you know, I continually say that, that even for the people now that are listening, they're part of BFA. You know, I want to be sure that whatever it is that we do, that we do it in integrity, because I always want to use this, this, this passage to stand before people and say, now, is there anybody that can say that we've done anything wrong? And by God's grace, and I hope prayerfully that we'll stay in this place that, that, that they can't do that. So, yeah. Uh, anyway, but that's that that phrase that phrase that Samuel is doing. I think is really interesting because I don't, I'm not sure that uh, some of the present uh, leaders, politicians, could stand before the people and say that. Really? I mean, I don't know if there's a lot of Samuels anymore, and I'm talking about at a really high level yeah. now. Mm-hmm. You know, you mentioned you know kind of in passing as a politician, the the understanding is is that you, you almost can't be a politician without. I'm not sure if that's the case or not. Well, I'm know. sure there's some honest politicians out there. Yeah, um, but my suspicion, and I don't know, is that they're few and far between. Okay. But the people said that they are witness. And then Samuel said to the people, it is Yehovah who appointed Moses. And now we're going to go through this history. And I, you know, Nehemiah, I'll be honest with you. I don't, I don't know how much you want to deal with this. What he's doing is he basically does what a lot of the prophets do. And a lot of things that happen in scripture, he goes back and says, now, let me remind you, Moses did the same thing. Deuteronomy is like the history lesson. Exactly. This this, this is who we're dealing with. And so I want to know how you want to deal with this. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm open. I mean, let's read it. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. No, you, you go ahead. No, you read it. You want to read it? Go ahead and read their history. I mean, or we could skip ahead if you don't want to. What are you saying? Well, I'm saying I think it's good homework for people. I'm not sure that okay. we need to do that whole thing. We can save some time here. Yeah. Um, he says, now stand and I will enter into judgment with you before Yehovah. Is that what you have? Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. That's an interesting word. It's the nephal of uh, Shaphat, mm-hmm. to enter into judgment. Um, and it's interesting. He's the judge. Mm-hmm. He's the shofet. That's his title. He's a mm-hmm. judge. But instead of him judging, he's entering into judgment, not as the judge, but as a party of conflict before God, mm-hmm. you know, with you, you know, him and the people. That, that's interesting. That caught my attention. Um, and if you don't want to read all the verses, if you want to skip ahead, I think we should skip ahead to verse 11. Yes, that is really that. verse 11. I was actually hoping that would that's be That's what you're going for, huh? Yeah, okay. absolutely. Yeah. Um, and again, it, you know, it does talk about a lot of things that we've talked about, you know, how they serve the uh, Baals and Ashtoreth, et cetera, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. Then, verse 11, and I'll just read it in the NASB if that's okay. Sure. It says, then Yehovah sent Jerobavel. Jerobavel. I guess it's, yeah, Jerobavel. And Beden and Jephthah and Samuel. Now, does it, now when he says that, He's talking. I mean, about himself. Yeah, you know, I just wanted to be sure I'm not missing yeah. anything here. It's like it's, yeah. it's like in the athletes. He says, you know, you know, we really uh, feel like we are uh, able to do such and such. He's talking. They talk about themselves. Oh, do they? Oh, all, all the time. Yeah. Okay, yeah. in the third person. In the third person. So Samuel's right. doing the athlete thing here. He's saying, yeah. then Yehovah and, sent. And I should point out. So we have in in um in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, we have this first person address where the person says, you know, I. You know, remember me for good, and I did this. That's very unusual mm. um, in the Tanakh. In fact, in most of the Tanakh, we have people referring to themselves in third person. Mm. You know, you have Moses writing in the Torah, and and and, the, and Yehovah spoken to Moses, saying, "Well, who wrote that?" Moses mm-hmm. wrote wrote mm-hmm. it, the Torah of Moses, mm-hmm. um, and there was nothing unusual about that. And in fact, this style doesn't show up really until Second Temple times mm-hmm. with Ezra and Nehemiah, and, and arguably with Daniel. Mm. Um, yeah. Wow. Well. Uh, do you want to say Can we talk about, about yes. Yerubal? Who's yes. Yerubal? Yes, yeah, I don't know. So Yerubal is called in 2 Samuel chapter, or in Judges 6.32. 
his, uh, Gideon is given the name Yeru Baal, which means he will strive with Baal. But then in 2 Samuel eleven twenty one, he's called Yeru Beshet. Mm. And, and what they've done there is they've taken the word Baal, which is the name of a pagan deity, and replaced it with the word Beshet or Boshet, which means shame. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's interesting. So why does 2 Samuel eleven twenty one have a different name for this figure for Yeru Baal? Uh, or Yer, why is he called Yeru Beshet in 2 Samuel eleven twenty one, and here in... Uh, He's called Yeru Baal. We see um, this. We see this happen. I'm not saying this in the is same book. No, I'm not. I'm saying I'm saying where, yet, where, where a person's name is. One, All right. Well, yeah. one possibility I'm, here. I'm kind of getting. You know, uh, I'm looking at you're going uh, down the road again. Well, here, here, what I'm 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 going to suggest that possibly in one Samuel chapter 12, mm-hmm. um, what we're reading here is that what we're reading here? Yeah, mm-hmm. one Samuel chapter 12 perhaps was written by a different author than two Samuel chapter 11. And this one author calls him Yerubal, the other calls him Yerubesha. It's a possibility. Um, what would support that is 1 Chronicles 29, 29. It says, The acts of King David uh, early and late are recorded in the history of Samuel the seer, the history of Nathan the prophet, and the history of God the seer, uh, or Gad the seer, God in Hebrew. So we've got um, these three different prophetic histories. And maybe when we look at um, uh, the book of Samuel it possibly and possibly the opening chapters of Kings, those are different sections of these prophetic histories written by different authors. Mm. I'm suggesting this is a possibility. Well, the reason that I, is a possibility, I'm it. glad that you brought that verse yeah. because that basically gives us, you know, a, you know, an example where there's. If I ask you, hey, let's open up the book of the history of God, the seer. Well, we don't have that book. We don't have that or, book, or maybe, or we maybe do. we do, <laughs> and it's just called Samuel. Exactly. And, and this actually makes a lot of sense if we think yeah. about it, the book of Samuel, or one Samuel and two Samuel mm-hmm. in English. Um, Samuel's dead, like halfway through the book. <laughs> so wait a minute, he folks, couldn't. He couldn't have written the last chapter. Folks, these are the kinds of things: language, history, and context. Oh, I guarantee you, there are people that have heard that right. and said, "Wait a minute, what did you just say?" <laughs> Even though you're reading the book and you don't think of right. it, but that's an example where we can say those other three books right. could definitely be a part of what was happening. Right, and and that and that's my um, suggestion that perhaps one Samuel, two Samuel, and the opening chapters of Kings mm-hmm. were written respectively by Samuel, Nathan, and God. Um, and that's what, uh, and that was understood in the in Chronicles when you know he's talking about the Book of Samuel here, mm-hmm. um, I think. So yeah, that's pretty cool. Now I will say something. I don't know if you wanna, if you, how you wanna do this. Um, oh, what yeah. about Badan? Who dat? Who dat? Who is Badan? <laughs> yeah. Who who is he? So we know who Yerubal is. That's Gideon. Yep. We know who Jephta Yiftach is. We know who Samuel is. He's the one speaking. Mm-hmm. Who on earth is Badan? Mm-hmm. Do you have any thought about it? First Chronicles seven seventeen. The son of Ulam was Badan, and he was a judge. What did he do? <laughs> what? <laughs> All right, you found it. You, I found uh, it. First, you figured first, it out. First Chronicle, Chronicles seven seventeen. The son of Ulam was Badan. Oh, so that tells me nothing. No, that's who it was. You asked who it was. But isn't that interesting? No, Here we have in the, in the in the book of Judges, and then in the opening chapters of Samuel, mm-hmm. we've got these stories of the judges. Um, and here it's referencing back sort of uh, retrospectively uh, Yerubal, Jerubal, and Samuel, and Yiftach, Jephthah, and Bidon, as if we're supposed to know who that is. Mm. So he doesn't appear to be mentioned in the book of Judges or Samuel, except for this one verse. Yeah. Unless, according to the rabbis, it's possible that Bidon refers to Samson. No, not in Chronicles, but here in, uh, in, in Samuel. You, no. You're going with that. I'm, I'm just... No, but I'm suggesting there's a possibility. I don't think it's correct, but it's possible. Um, and and why? How did they get Samson out of Bidon? Because Samson was from a tribe of Don or Dan, mm-hmm. and Bidon would be in, in Dan? Dan or through Dan or mm-hmm. with Dan, uh-huh. unless Dan. his name was Bidon. <laughs> and and, and I, I tend to think like, look, we don't have to read into this, you know, a character that we don't recognize, um, or, or, or you know, for, force an identity on mm-hmm. Bidon. What it, what it, this is actually really exciting to me. What it tells me is that. The prophets, when they wrote the history, mm-hmm. they weren't telling us everything. Mm-hmm. This is not the type of history as you, you know you might read, you know, a history book today mm-hmm. in America, um, which is supposed to, you know, and even that doesn't cover everything, obviously. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But this was not an exhaustive history. Mm-hmm. This is a prophetic history, mm-hmm. and that's why it's in the prophets because mm-hmm. I believe that this is in the prophets a prophetic history because there's certain lessons and morals and and, and concepts that were, were that it's trying to teach us and maybe pictures it's trying to give us, mm-hmm. and um, and Bedan for whatever mm-hmm. reason we weren't taught about who Badan was or what mm-hmm. he did mm-hmm. but there was a lot that went on mm-hmm. in the time of the judges and in biblical times that we don't know about mm-hmm. and this actually is really encouraging to me because you know when I studied at Hebrew University of Jerusalem 
they would, um, you know, they'd pull out, open some like Assyrian text and they'd say, hey, look, there was this major war going on and the Bible doesn't mention it. And, you know, and, and they were kind of kind of doing this to, like, put the Bible down. Mm-hmm. And I and, you know, I read this and I'm like, wait, so there's a lot that could went on. Not, could you not take away my 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 love and respect for the Hebrew University? Oh, there's some, great you, things at Hebrew University. Because you remind me of these things yeah. and I just don't want to hear them. No, the but, Hebrew University is, is one of the best schools in the world when it comes to uh, but they're teaching liberal, they're liberal. biblical language. Yeah. But what, in the, their entire uh, what's called historical critical approach is something I don't agree with. Which is basically ripping scripture apart and um, you know deconstructing it to where it's no longer the word of God. That's the part I don't accept and never accepted it, and that's you know why I didn't become a professor there. Um, <laughs> but the part where they're teaching language, wow, they're some of the best in the world, the best in the world, the best. Um, in the world. Okay, and, you know, and so it's a matter of like with anything, and I hope like with people who approach uh, this this podcast, this program, you know. Take the parts that, you know, that make sense to you. And, you know, mm-hmm. uh, you know, how, how is that expression about, you know, uh, eating the meat and spitting out the bones? Oh, or, yeah. You yeah. know, and that's what you have to do with anything in life. Use your discernment to do that. Mm. Okay. Awesome. Well, uh, the next verse is is, uh, is really interesting. I think it's really interesting. Yeah. Um, because I could read it this way. Uh, when you saw that Satan, the king of the sons of Ammon, came against you, you said to me, Keith, now how did you get that? When you saw that, what verse are you reading? No, First Samuel twelve, verse twelve. Oh, okay, this is about backing into oh, something. Oh, okay, when you saw that Satan, the king of the sons of Ammon, came against you, you said to me, "Well, where would I get that?" Well, if I look at this word Nahash, I find out that Hanahash is the word that's used in Genesis chapter three, and many people interpret that the serpent in Genesis chapter three was really Satan. In fact, we hear this. Many times when people say, and, and this was the, this was Satan who went to, uh, to, to to Adam and Eve. And it doesn't say Satan. It says Hanahash. The snake. The snake. And we have a man, a king, who was actually called Nahash. Nahash. Whose name meant snake. <laughs> was snake. But again, if I'm not reading it and not looking at it and just kind of looking through maybe some historical traditional thoughts about what that was going on in Genesis chapter 3, I would translate that and say, well, this is when you saw that Nahash and his real name was Satan. I could have do a whole teaching about that, except for if I actually look at the words and see how the words are used, the teaching kind of goes out the door. So I really cannot translate now, can that. We, could, we, could we say this? Can I, can, I, okay. can I kind of flesh this out a little bit? Okay. Is it possible to use the snake in Genesis 3 as a symbol, as a, as a, as a maybe a picture of what Satan is like? Yeah, we could. And then we'd also have to say that, that maybe that snake is also, uh, and that if, when Moses is uh, raising up the snake, catch me on this if I'm right Uh-oh. or if I'm wrong. No, 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 stop. <laughs> no, 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 no. You want to go down that road? <laughs> Wait, so, that, so the snake on the pole could be Satan then if we're consistent. Exactly. You've got to be consistent. Say. So and my point That's is, not, yeah. and, and the reason I'm bringing this up, Nehemiah, in all yeah. seriousness, uh, this is a very freeing to me. Very freeing to yeah. me. The uh, Last week's um, episode, if you didn't listen to it, folks, you really need to because we talked in that uh, episode about Hasatan. And, and you did a really good job in terms of looking through how that word was actually used. And many times it will say in English it will give Satan, Satan as a uh, as uh, as a um, uh, uh, capitalizing S um, that Satan is a name. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, a proper name, but actually in the Hebrew, or the role of, a, of an angel. Uh, yeah, a role yeah. of an angel. But it, yeah. in English, they'll say Satan with a capital S. If right. you didn't listen to last week, please go ahead and do that. I'm now kind yeah. of connecting it to this week, just because when I come across this word Nahash, I'm immediately reminded right. Ha Nahash. And you know what this reminds me of? This reminds me of I've had this discussion with people coming from the Hebrew roots perspective mm-hmm. and, and messianic perspective, and, and they'll say, you know, oh, we're coming to Passover, and there's leaven, and leaven represents sin. And leaven is a bad thing. And I've even met people, believe it or not, who have established an entire diet where there's no leaven in their diet. Based on the fact that it's sin. That leaven is sin. And and I say, well, what about, I think it's Matthew 24, maybe somewhere around there, where where Yeshua talks about, he says, well, the kingdom of heaven is like leaven, and their leaven is a good thing. (laughs) So so you got to be careful with these metaphors and these symbols. You know, that's Um, a perfect perfect reason why I did that. And and one of the verses I want to bring where I think... Nachashes, maybe Satan, mm-hmm. is um, or definitely some evil figure, mm-hmm. is Isaiah twenty-seven verse one. In that day, Yehovah will will punish with his great, cruel, mm-hmm. mighty sword, Leviathan, the elusive serpent in Hebrew, Nachash, mm-hmm. Leviathan, the twisting serpent again, Nachash. Yes, he will slay the dragon of the sea, mm-hmm. and, and 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 the symbolism here in Isaiah twenty-seven, as I understand it, is God is going to defeat death, and there'll be eternal life. Uh-huh. And so this snake there. Is this symbol of what's killing us? Mm-hmm. But you know, isn't um, and it, maybe that does tie into Genesis but, three as a symbolism. But you know perhaps. what? But, but is I guess the point that I was trying to make is how the power of the words. Mm-hmm. 
first knowing what doesn't the mean every are. snake is Satan. That's it, the point. That's the point. Right. Of Otherwise, you get into trouble with you know the holding up. The In other words, and, Satan yeah. was you know okay, <laughs> look at Satan and you will live. <laughs> <laughs> right? Me? No, that's bad. Well, I could do a whole <laughs> teaching on this. Oh, you may. No, no, no. I'm, but but yeah. again, it's 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 really powerful. So make sure you check last week uh, when yeah. you saw that Nahash, who's actually a man, uh, the king of the sons of Ammon. Uh, yeah. Came against you. You said to me, "No, but a king yeah. should reign." And then here's what he's doing: he's bringing us back. If you didn't do your homework, that yeah. this was the reason that they decided. Look, you know, um, we need a king. We need a king to reign right, over us. Right, right, right. Although Yehovah is your God, uh, was your king, and I, man, I could wish we could talk about that. Can We're we please talking. talk about Yehovah being king? I, well, we can, king? we can, but there's look, a really there, sad there, story. There's a sad, the sad story. story. I don't know the um, story. Uh, do I know the sad man, story? There's too many things I could say. Let me let's let's focus on the fact that we're talking about him as king as we're on the bus. On our way to come and do this session, what was the today, sign you mean. Uh, today? Yeah. What was the sign that was in the back of the car? Oh, uh, Hashem, Hashem Hu Melech. Hume- Hume- yeah, <laughs> Yehovah is the king. He is the king, and this was on yeah. this car. I mean, and here it, a bumper sticker. About, yeah, although okay. Yehovah was your king. Right. Wow. So, mm. so here we have this, 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 this. I don't know this, this. Um, I don't know what the word is. There's this tension. Mm-hmm. On the one hand, we have. Saul is the king. He's the anointed. On the other hand, we have Yehovah as the king. Mm-hmm. And I think this is a tension that, that, that comes with us throughout the Tanakh. God as the king versus the human king. And, and one of the verses that comes to mind is Zechariah chapter 14, verse 9, one of my favorite verses. And Yehovah shall be, and this is the end times, it shall come to pass, Yehovah shall be king over the entire earth, and on that day he will be one, and his name will be one. Zechariah 14, 9. But then we have Ezekiel 37, 24. My servant David will be king over them. And they will all have one shepherd that we talked about this recently. Mm-hmm. And we will fo- and they will follow my laws and be careful to keep my decrees. So in this end times, you have Yehovah as the king and you have David as the king. And that's this, this like mm. this this um, mm-hmm. now, now in 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 a uh, in um, Hebrew University they call this sibat uh, fula mm. or dual causality. And that's the idea that that you can have. Um, a man as king and you can have God as king and there's no contradiction in the Hebrew way of thinking there. Mm-hmm. Just like we we can see one of the judges will say he was the savior of Israel mm-hmm. and then Yehovah mm-hmm. is the savior of Israel. Yehovah did it through the judge. Some people want to call it agency. At Hebrew, they like to call it dual causality. Um, Hosea chapter 3 verse 5, uh, afterwards the Israelites will return and seek Yehovah their God and David their king. That ties mm-hmm. the two in together. Yes, um, They will come trembling to Yehovah and to his blessings in the last day. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so so we don't have a problem in, in the Hebrew thought with this dual causality, um, with this sibatiu takfula. Yehovah is king and then there's a man on earth who represents him and is also king. Wow. Um, you know, and that's the situation here. But... His point was, look, wasn't I good enough as your king? Why did why did you need um, you know what you know? There's a ten, there's definitely a certain amount of tension despite all that. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, um, we and I'm not I'm not trying to I'm not trying to go the easy way out here. Yeah. But once again, we have um, a little a little section, and the question is, do we want to go verse by verse? Can we read We've verse fourteen? We can go to fourteen. Yeah. Um, and then I want us to take a look at sixteen as a, okay. a, a phrase that is. Uh, go ahead. Fourteen. Oh, go ahead. Fourteen. Uh, 14. So if you will fear Yehovah and serve him and listen to his voice and not, re- boy, I mean, this is, this, we hear this, and not rebel against the command of Yehovah, then both you and also the king who reigns over you will follow Yehovah your God. Yeah. In verse 15. If you will not listen to the voice of Yehovah, but re- rebel against the command of Yehovah, then the hand of Yehovah will be against you as it was against your fathers. Yeah. Um, what translation was that out of curiosity? NASB. Let me read you from the NIV or, mm-hmm. or the JPS. Okay. So that is verse 14. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, let's read. Uh, this is 1 Samuel chapter 12. Mm-hmm. 12 verse 14. It says, If you revere the Lord, wor- worship him and obey him, and will not flout the Lord's command, if both you and the king who reigns over you will follow the Lord your God well and good. Do you have that? Mm-mm. So he adds the words well and good. Mm-hmm. And we have a situation here where we have, um, there's an oath formula, and I think the JPS has misunderstood that. But that, that's complicated. Let's let's move on. Yeah. Here, he, yeah. You're, you're kidding, right? The word the, good you, is not there in the Hebrew. I don't see it. I don't see it anywhere. <laughs> where is it? It's not there in the Hebrew. Yeah. And, and here's the way it has to really be read. So, so basically the idea here is that if you obey, you will be after Yehovah. <laughs> mm-hmm. But if you disobey, the hand of Yehovah will be against you. Mm-hmm. In other words, they read... They read it as, you know, if you obey and you go after Yehovah, then that's good. But then they had to add the word good. <laughs> In other words, the, w- the way we're looking at it here, the, the way I read it, is um, 
it, you know, if if you obey, then you will be following Yehovah, and that in itself is is the blessing. And that's what the NAS has. has. The NASB yeah. has that. It says, uh, "Both you and also the King who reigns over you will follow Yehovah your God." Okay, so I like the NASB. They yeah. got it right. Awesome. Absolutely wonderful. But beware that those who are reading other translations. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Okay. So um, take your stand, even now. Take your stand, even now. Take your stand and see this great thing which Yehovah will do before your eyes. Um, <laughs> and then he does this miracle. I mean, verse seventeen. It, it, it like Samuel is like on a roll. He he he's he's gives them history. He's 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 told them his ministry is yeah. coming to an end. He's telling them, listen, I've not done anything wrong. And then at the end, he says. Now, take your stand and see this great thing which Yehovah will do before your eyes. It is not, is it not the wheat harvest today? I will call to Yehovah that he may send thunder and rain. Then you will know and see that your wickedness is great, which you have done in the sight. Wait, hold on here. It's like, he says, now, I'm telling you all these things. This is what's going on with me. I've given you your king. Here's what he's told you. And then this verse comes. So I want to ask you a question. Why does he say, is it not the wheat harvest today? What's the connection? You're supposed to. The so wheat, it doesn't like, rain in, in, egg, in exactly in the summer in Israel, and by the time you have a wheat harvest, there should not be any rain. There should not be. And any if rain. there is, it will damage the wheat, mm-hmm. which hasn't been harvested yet. And so all of a sudden, he does this, and he says, "Now uh, it's not the time for rain. I will call the Yehovah that He may send thunder and rain. The voice you know, that loud thunder and, and, and mm-hmm. the rain. Then you will know and see that your wickedness is great, which you have done in the sight of Yehovah King. Yehovah, and what's the wickedness? By asking for yourselves a king. Mm-hmm. Wow. And I will tell you, you know, do your homework, folks, on this and go back and see what the response was once they went to Samuel and said, please give us a king and what Yehovah said. It's a sad story to me. It really is. It's mm-hmm. like when I hear him respond uh, in the in the scripture, it's a sad story. It's like, okay, they don't want me to be their king. Here, here's your king. And I mean, of course, the kingship is where we get the whole idea of, uh, of the Mashiach com- uh, coming. Yeah. But but when that initial that initial um, interchange between the people and him, it's a sad story. Mm-hmm. I really think it is. Yeah. Um, so Samuel called unto Yehovah, and Yehovah sent thunder and rain that day, and all the people greatly feared two things: they feared Samuel, and they feared Yehovah. Kind of reminds me of of uh, what happened with Moses. How. Uh, how they talk about they see Moses and they they you know we understand that Jehovah and also how they how they look at uh, look at Moses. But nineteen, all the people said to Samuel, "Pray for your servants to the Lord Jehovah your God that we may not die, for we have added to all our sins by asking ourselves for a king." Do not fear, he says. You have committed all this evil, yet do not turn aside from following Jehovah, but serve him with all your heart. You must not turn aside, for then you would go after futile things, which cannot profit or deliver because they are futile. For Yehovah will not abandon his people on account of his great name. What a beautiful phrase. Mm-hmm. Because Yehovah has been pleased <clears throat> to make you, even though you are hard-headed, stiff-necked, uh, you know, evil and frust- you know, he says, this is again, this statement of grace and uh, good news. Uh, he's been pleased to make you a people for himself. Yeah, and I just got to assign some homework to some people. Mm-hmm. Um, please go look at Deuteronomy chapter seventeen, verse fourteen, where it mm-hmm. talks about you know when Israel will ask for a king. And there is a little mystery here in this passage because yeah. on the one hand he, he gave permission for them to have a king, on the other hand when they go and they ask for the king, he says, "Well, you've rejected me." So it, it's a little confusing, and I understand it. Yeah, I understand it. But on the other hand, well, he gave them permission to ask for a king or he says when they ask for a king look look at it Deuteronomy 17 14 mm-hmm. and yeah it's interesting well Nehemiah um, it's your turn oh you know what I, I will say something let me just say something Nehemiah yeah. we're actually we do need to do a ministry minute for a couple of reasons not only because yeah. we haven't done it but also we don't have anyone to support us for next week so the <laughs> oh. <laughs> profit and pearls is over after this one <laughs> we had no one for this week we have no one for next week well, it's over good. unless you can do a great ministry minute and give people an understanding of how them helping us actually helps them also learn well, can, and, can, and go can forward. I share something that happened just today in my, you know, with with my ministry, so so I put out this study and and uh, for the for my support team, and I got this email from someone, and he was very upset. Mm. He's upset. He says, you know, for for years everything you've taught has been for free. Why all of a sudden are you are you saying that you know I've got to be part of your support team and support your ministry in order to um, get access to this teaching? And and that's a completely valid question. Um, 
you know, and, 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 and let me tell you, let me share some of the history and the thought process of what happened is, you know, I, I went to China and I had, the, uh, you know, when did the, you go to China? What I year went was to that? China. That was, um, what year are we in now? 2015. Mm-hmm. So it was, it was the summer of 2013. Mm-hmm. And, and part of the reason I went to China is I needed a break from ministry. Um, but also I needed to eat, you know, I went there to work, um, you know, and, and I, and I was working there, um, you know, teaching English in a high school. And I actually really liked it. They paid um, you for that? They paid me. They paid me, you know, not a lot of money, but it was enough for me to live. And I was very happy there. I had, they even you gave know, you a place to live. They gave me a free place to live. They gave me um, free utilities. I was, you know, living, you know, I was living a good life there. It was good. You know, I wasn't making, you know, a huge amount of money, but it was enough where I really didn't have to worry about, um, you know, I didn't have to worry about utilities. I didn't have to worry about, you know, the electrical bill. It, it was a good, it was a good shtick. Mm-hmm. And I liked teaching the kids. I like teaching high school. I was a good high school teacher. It was fun. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, but as I was there over in China, I had people contacting me and they said, look, you're, you're teaching these you know, Chinese high school kids. What about, what about us? And I had people who said to me, look, I'll pay you. I'll pay you to, uh, you know, just to teach me personally. I'll pay you more than you make in your, the entire month there in China to work, you know, <laughs> a full time job. And, um, and, and I prayed about that. And I decided I wasn't going to do that particular situation, but I decided, you know what? This is what I've been called to do. I've got to be teaching people. Hmm. This is what Jehovah has called me to do. But I also, you know, I've got to pay the bills and I've got, you know, um, I've got to live. And so I decided I was going to leave China. Um, and actually, even when I, sort of the tail end of China, I, I, I said, you know, look, so there have been people who've supported my ministry. And that's going to allow me to, as you know, if they continue to do that, I'll, I'll be able to leave China and, and um and continue to do what I'm doing, to teach and, give and to teach yeah. the word of God. Uh, but I wanted to give a sort of like a, a special teaching as a thank you for those who who were supporting my ministry because they allowed me to teach everybody else. You know, and if you look at what I what I put out there, um, I would say you know I don't know seventy five uh, or to ninety percent of it. I, I don't know what the number is um, is free to everybody. No questions asked. They don't have to sign up for every anything. Yep, they just show up. They download whatever they want. And and look, I think that's how it should be. But for those who have allowed me and enabled me and given me given me the ability to have joined me in this process, so that I can share for everybody else, I want to give them a little you know a little mm-hmm. extra um, to share with them. Uh, and that you know that allows me to keep going. And and so you know if, if you've got a problem with that, you know okay, I mean I, I could go back, I suppose, and teach English in China again. But mm-hmm. I really feel like this is what I'm supposed to be doing. Wow, that's something. So how can people support? So they can go to nehemiahswall dot com and make a donation, or you can contact Deb. Um, there's a one eight hundred number and all the newsletters. Uh, and you know or go to the, or you can actually go to the contact form at nehemiahswall dot com and contact mm-hmm. us and find out how you can be part of the support team. Oh, awesome. Well, I will say, Nehemi, I think we're in probably about week five of the summer, four or five of the summer. I'm not sure what the dates are right now, but we've, for the last few weeks, um, by faith, um, presently it's not completed right now as I'm here in Jerusalem, but by the time you're listening to this, by God's grace, a lot of time and energy and resources will have gone into giving people a chance to, one, learn uh, the basics of biblical Hebrew. Uh, It's going to be an audio course. Uh, There's so many other things that are available on our website. I always talk about the premium content library, and I will say, um, you know, really, that, that has really been a place where it's giving us the chance to produce other things. And there are a lot of things to produce. But I have to just say, um, just right now, what I want to challenge people to do, if only 10% of those that were listening would simply, uh, at the end of this, go to BFAinternational.com, uh, make a donation of any amount. And, you know, you can even designate for certain things that we have there. There are things that you can do that regard to production, things that w- you can do as far as other people being able to listen and to hear. What I mostly love about what's happening with BFA right now is that we've got a group of people around the world. I was just in Namibia, met with 50 pastors. I, I, I just have to be... Wow, I just cannot tell you, 50 pastors from Namibia that are saying, you know, we really want to understand more about the um, Hebrew roots of our faith. We want to understand the language. We want to understand the history and the context. And we want to bring this information to Namibia. It's a country that really only has about 2 million people. And what I like to say is I've actually prayed and, and done a teaching on this by now, hopefully this summer. You'll be able to get a chance to see the teaching, the Namibia series out of the Biblical Brick teaching series, which is also going to be made available to people so that they can see it. 
But we really asked, I really asked the Father for an, a chance to reach an entire country. And, and here you've got 50 pastors that have a whole bunch of access to other pastors who are saying, we want to learn more about the language, history, and context of Scripture. So that's what we're doing right now. Just one example, bfainternational.com. Go there today, definitely, and, and do something to help us. Uh, next week, we don't have a sponsor, so we need someone for this week. Next week, and there's a couple other slots also. They can go to a, our site and, and do that. And you can even designate it, and, and Nehemi and I will be able to both see to see that. But again, I just want to thank people for, and you do it best, Nehemiah, of those that are standing with you. Thanks for those that are already doing it. And I think there are people that are listening right now that will do this, that they will get on board with us at BFAinternational.com and help us. You know, God gives vision. He always gives provision. He's going to provide and he uses his people to do it. So if you're listening and you feel moved, we really would appreciate um, your support at any level. Mm-hmm. Oh, so that's the really the end of this section, Nehemiah. We've got so much more that we're going to be doing um, over the next few weeks, uh, I can't believe what we've already done. <laughs> yeah. and, and we took a break in the middle of all that and did a, a what I call a, a hat trick. Three different audio blogs, uh, three different, um, I think you're calling them podcasts. Um, yeah. And I will say, Nehemia. Um, What's you know, the difference between an audio blog and a podcast? I don't think there is a difference. We call it an audio <laughs> blog just because it is and it's a podcast. But in both cases, people Maybe get a chance is, yeah. to... Uh, to hear and, and, and we'll continue to talk and, and share with each other and sharpen one another so that we can continue to, uh, to do profit. Oh man, I mm-hmm. want to end it with here with prayer. Yehovah, Malkeno, Yehovah, our King. I ask Yehovah that you know, um, you continue to guide us. I know that you guided me in China and you, you set me up with an opportunity to teach your word even to the to my Chinese students and and I feel like you've called me to teach. To people around the world, and and I ask you to guide me in this ministry, and 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 please, you I guide Keith in his ministry, so mm-hmm. that we always do what honors your name. Mm-hmm. And Yehovah, I'm so thankful for all those who are standing with me on the wall, and I'm thankful to them because they allow me to uh, continue to share your word with with everybody. And and I don't. This is no small thing, Yehovah. I know this is a great blessing that you have you have. Um, given me and, and given them to be part of this as well. Mm-hmm. So I thank you for that, Yehovah. And for all those who are standing with Keith, mm-hmm. um, standing with him at the next to the biblical foundations down there in the tunnel, those giant foundations, helping them, him uh, establish those for people, Yehovah. That's, that's no small thing either. That's a huge thing. And I'm so thankful for you for all of this, Yehovah. And Yehovah, I ask that as we continue to do these prophet pearls that you, that you guide us, that you mm-hmm. put your words in our mouths and and in our hearts, so that we'll always honor you, Yehovah. And, mm-hmm. and Yehovah, I ask that when when the time comes and and your Messiah comes here to earth, that that um, you have mercy on those who who don't recognize him when he first comes and who don't see it, and let let him have the same heart as as Saul in this situation, his heart of mercy, Yehovah. And on that day, when when they finally do see that that he is your chosen anointed one, that. Mm. Yehovah, that and they turn to him, that he uh, accepts their uh, belief in in him as the king, and doesn't make that a day of of, um, of wrath and judgment, but a day of honoring you and you above all, Yehovah, in your holy name. Amen. Thank you for listening to Prophet Pearls with Nehemia Gordon and Keith Johnson. For more information, please visit nehemiahswall.com and bfainternational.com.